today we're running the AC Marathon with five watches because I wanted to see how the bib chip time compares to all of these watches that I'm wearing. So today I'm gonna show you all of the data. We have distance, pacing, even I'm talking about battery life. Compare it all, we'll look at the GPS tracks on Google Maps to see how it compares, which one's actually straight off. And I'll talk about live pacing because if the data is accurate, if you're not seeing that information on your watch while running, it's not going to be as helpful. And lastly, I'll talk about my favorite and my recommendation watches. Now looking at all this data, the overall winner is the Apple Watch Ultra 2 in terms of the best quote unquote data that was matched to my chip time. But that doesn't mean I'm in love with it and we'll dive more into the details of why. So first I wanna say how I ran this experiment and which watches I used. So I used the Garmin Phoenix 8 right here, 51 millimeter. The Apple Watch Ultra 2 in all black with the trail loop. The Apple Watch Series 10 with this band. The Coros Pace Pro, which just came out with this band. And lastly, the Amazfit T-Rex 3, which is the cheapest of all three. One, I made sure that it all charged to 100% at four in the morning when I took them off the chargers. 4.30, oh man. Two is on the Apple Watches. I disconnected them from my phone, so I turned off Bluetooth so that way they would not be getting notifications or support from my iPhone. And three is I used this app called HealthFit to export my Apple Watch data as a .fit file. And then I used the Koros, the Garmin dashboards to export a .fit file on their website. And I used the Zep app to export a .fit file for the Maze Fit. And then how I wore these watches is what I learned from DC Rainmaker. You want to have a good amount of distance. You don't want the watches touching because that could potentially impact GPS. Even just wearing them on the same arm could impact GPS. So this experiment is not perfect, but I had one watch on my hand, two on my wrist, and the third, the Apple Watch Series 10 up on my forearm with a sweatband in between to make sure that it didn't slide down my arm. The Garmin Phoenix 8, the Apple Watch Ultra 2 in black. We got the Amaze Fit and the Coros Pace Poro and the Apple Watch Series 10. GPS, GPS locked. What are we looking for? Hella good, I'm coming for you. Five watches marathon. I don't know how hella good runs with four watches. I can only do them on my palms because if I put them on my forearms, they always slide down. And then just a few stats about me and my size in terms of how we gather this data. So I'm about six feet tall, approximately 210 pounds. I haven't weighed myself in a while. It was 46 degrees Fahrenheit, eight Celsius that day, 60% humidity. And if you haven't watched my vlog about the New York City Marathon, please go watch that. And I took these dot fit files and I put them into the DC Rainmaker Analyzer in which we were able to see the raw GPS data as well as I went to each of the apps to get the averages, which I'm putting in this chart right here. And if you didn't know about the bib, there are checkpoints every 3.1 miles where there's a chip in here, I think which is right here. And that gets scanned as you run through those checkpoints. There are 30 timing points and 64 timing controllers on the New York City Marathon race and 50 race staff are dedicated to the tracking experience. So that's pretty crazy. So this should be 99% accurate. And also noting that when you run a marathon, you're not just running in a straight line. Ideally, you want to be on the blue line because it's the shortest distance, which I kind of tried, but we were doing a lot of weaving in and out of people if you're trying to speed up and get ahead. So I need to take that into account that most likely I did not run 26.2 miles, but potentially half to maybe even one mile more than that. Now, first step is to take off my hat because I've been told I should wear this without a hat and I might shave my head soon. So. Let's just record these videos without my hat so we remember what my hairline looked like before it's all gone. Battery life. So the first thing in the morning, I took them all off the charger at 4 a.m. My race started at 9.45 a.m. and lasted about four hours, which is approximately 2 p.m. So that's about 10 hours with four hours of GPS and heart rate tracking. And looking at the winners, we had the Coros Pace Pro and the Amazfit T-Rex 3 at 87%. So they only lost 13% of battery across that entire time. The Apple Watch Series 10 survived 52%. If you have some of the older series watches, they might struggle, but the newest ones will get you through a marathon, don't worry. The Ultra 2, approximately 60%. I actually turned on Bluetooth and I put connected to my phone and I forgot to double check the battery. So the battery did get down to like 42% from wearing it for a couple hours after the marathon. And the Garmin Phoenix 8 at 83%. One thing to note, depending on the GPS situation, the Phoenix 8, the Ultra 2, and the Pace Pro and the T-Rex 3 all have multi-band GPS. So that just means they're more likely to be accurate in places with tall buildings because they're going to connect with two GPS satellites at a time to triangulate where you might be. Whereas the Apple Watch Series 10 does not have that. And it's more likely when they're in the multi-band mode that they're going to use more battery life. Now we'll look at the GPS tracks. So we have the Garmin Phoenix 8, which is gonna be red. The Ultra 2, which is black. The Apple Watch Series 10, which is a light purple. Pace Pro is green. And the T-Rex 3 and the Maze Fit is blue. And all these watches will be overlaid on top of each other so we can see, hey, how close they are. So the marathon starts in Staten Island and you actually run across a bridge. 
And luckily for us, I got to run on the bottom of the bridge, which means the GPS accuracy is going to be a bit more challenging because you don't have a clear view of the sky. GPS satellites are in the sky and you want a clear view to get the best distance pacing data. I started all of the watches just slightly before. Wait, when do we start our watches? We'll see the start line. It's going to look like that. It's okay. It's okay. For the actual start point, so we make sure that we got the entire marathon covered. Under a bridge. Wow, we're actually running the marathon. <laughs> There's the little village. Hello! No waving, that's calories. You can see the black is the Apple Watch Ultra 2, and the red is the Garmin Phoenix 8, which are the two most expensive watches in this lineup. And it seemed like the second half of the bridge, the Ultra 2 did well, but the Pace Pro and the Phoenix 8 jumped into the water, whereas the Series 10 and the T Rex stayed somewhat close to the bridge. Once we got off the bridge, the Series 10 is this purple line here. It kind of jumped out off the street. So it strayed a little bit. And then all of them, once we got out of that bridge, they all lined up on top of each other. Looks like the data's looking very strong here. We got around these loops. They look clean. They look really close to each other. That This looks so nice. It looks like they're in synchronization. It's a synchronized dance with all the watches. We got a little bit of a stray here with the Ultra 2. Not sure what happened there. For the most part, this is looking good. It looks like on some of these turns, maybe there are tall buildings here. We had the Pace Pro jump off the street a bit. And then for some reason, when we got the McCarran, the Apple Watch Series 10 kind of strayed a little bit. You can see the Series 10, the Pace Pro, and the T-Rex stayed on the left side, the Phoenix 8, and the Apple Watch Ultra 2 on the right side. What's very fascinating is I was wearing these two watches on the right on my right arm, and the other watches on my left arm. So that looks like it has an impact on which arm I was wearing them, and I was kind of running like this. And I had the Phoenix 8 on my wrist here, and the Ultra 2 on my right wrist whereas the other three watches were on my left forearm and wrist. So that seems to have a slight impact in terms of where the GPS track was actually picking for me to go. They all went to the right side of the street or the left side. That's really interesting. Like I said, this experiment isn't perfect. Then we got to here, it looks like the Pace Pro in the Series 10 and the Amazfit also jumped off all on my left arm. Maybe there were just tall buildings on the le left side that made it harder for them. Then we entered the Queensboro Bridge. So another bridge where you're actually running underneath and the sky is pretty much blocked. And, and that's where all the watches started to struggle. It looks like they're kind of jumping around everywhere as we go through the bridge. For the most part, they stayed on the bridge. It looks like the Series 10 jumped out a bit, the Phoenix 8 and the T-Rex as well. Whereas the Pace Pro, mile 15. And the, and the Ultra 2 stayed on the bridge for the most part, but then the Pace Pro jumped off the bridge near the end. The loop here that we did, we run down this part and we looped around. It looks like the Series 10 and the Pace Pro cut the loop a bit short because they were off the bridge earlier on. But once we were back in the street, pretty consistently strong. It's insane how much the three left watches are close to each other. And then the watches on my right arm are also close to each other. So even this like one foot of distance between the two watches trying to get GPS signals separated them on left and right sides of the street. That's fascinating. That's actually really fascinating. Over here, we had the um, Amazfit the Series 10 and the Pace Pro jump around a little bit. Maybe there are tall buildings on the left side. I will actually have the DC Rainmaker link, public link below if you wanna go dive into this information yourself and see it all. At this point, this is the one spot where the Ultra 2 jumped off the crowd. And I'm not sure, it got kind of tired of hanging out with everybody. Small segment, but overall it was holding strong. Then we got into Central Park, going down Fifth Ave. Same thing, the watches on my left wrist, I think because the buildings were on the left side, they might have just started to stray a little bit. What's interesting is the T-Rex, which I think was on my hand, so that was probably the closest to the inside of my body, had the best data, the Series 10 was the farthest out, and the Pace Pro was on my left wrist. You can see how even in the order on my arm is the same order that the GPS tracks are, so something was disturbing them in the left side, most likely. Even just that slight change of like wearing it on my hand, on my wrist, or on my forearm, had an impact on the GPS signal. And then here's the finish line, same thing. Left side is where the buildings are, right side is where the park is. It looks like the Apple Watch, it's a direct straight line, the Ultra 2. So it got smoothed with Apple Maps data. Even over here, it's like a sharp turn, straight line, straight line, which I'll speak about the final distances in a second. But even the finish line, the left watches struggled a bit and then they all finished right here at the end of the finish line. So for the most part, I would argue all these watches are pretty good. They're good enough. You're, not always, you're never gonna get perfect data, but these, there's little strays here and there and some watches here and there, 
But I would say for the most part, held on pretty strong considering I was probably eating gels, I was holding things, maybe I was hugging friends, like that's could also impact the GPS data. But none of these watches had any massive issues. All of them have multi-band, dual band GPS, except for the Series 10, and the Series 10 still held up pretty well. But I know most people aren't gonna look at the GPS tracks in this much detail. You're going to look at the actual total data around distance and pacing. So let's look at that. And that's where I built this chart. So from a time perspective, my marathon time was a 3.43.35, very quickly. Obviously the Apple Watch Ultra was the closest in time. I think I just snagged it the earliest as I was going from right to left. So we're not gonna give it points to anyone for that. But from a distance perspective, 26.2 miles. The Ultra 2 gave me 26.26 miles, which is 0 0.06 closest to the actual distance. And what I'm not happy with that is when I looked at the GPS track we saw, you know, here on 59th Street, how the Apple Watch Ultra 2 was a perfect straight line. I remembered I did definitely not run a perfectly straight line on that street. I was more on the left side of the road and I was weaving through a lot of people near the finish. So I did not run a perfectly straight line. There was definitely more mileage. So although the Apple Watch Ultra 2 was the closest in terms of distance, and it was probably giving me the best live pacing data because it would buzz closest to each of the mile markers than all the other watches. But I'm 90% sure that I probably ran a lot more than this because I'm weaving through a lot of people. And as we saw in the Apple Maps data, it was smoothing it out. So that's probably why it was able to get as close as possible to the actual race distance. If we look at all the other watches, they were at 26.53, 26.48, 26.58, 26.51, 26 all within the 26.5-ish range. So total distance wise, almost everyone was very close. The next thing is pacing. So when you upload a Strava, everyone's gonna look at your overall pace, like how did you do? The New York City Marathon bib chip time for me was eight minutes and 32 seconds minutes per mile. And the closest was the Apple Watch Ultra 2 at eight minutes and 31 seconds, considering that the data has been smoothed with Apple Maps. But the other watches gave me much faster paces because their distances were longer. So we're getting 826, 825, 827. And I even added in the Whoop because I did wear it on my bicep, but that imports my Apple Watch, Apple Health data for distance pacing. And it is oddly slightly different than some of the other information, but I think it might've pulled in the Ultra 2 and the Series 10 data and somehow merged them. I'm not sure, but the data's there. Next up, heart rate. So how did the heart rate hold up? So I wore actually one of these chest straps right here. This is the Garmin HRM Pro Plus. I actually had a core body temperature sensor, as well as a Flowbio S1 sweat sensor, which neither of these worked because there was no internet and I couldn't get them to start, which is a bit sad because I could have used that data too. Flowbio core, help me, why did it not work when my phone did not have cellular connection? The apps just failed me. So that's gonna be the most accurate data and it was connected to the Phoenix 8 because the Phoenix 8 was on my hand and you're not gonna get great heart rate data on your hand. The Amazfit was also on my hand, so we're going to discount these two watches in terms of heart rate but we can compare the chest strap data from the Phoenix 8 to the Coros Pace Pro, the Series 10, and the Ultra 2. And I just added in the T-Rex as well, just in case. So average heart rate was 160, and highest heart rate was 184. The closest was the Apple Watch Series 10 with 160 and 181. The Pace Pro was pretty close in terms of the average. It missed the highest heart rate by like eight beats per minute, so I'm not sure, maybe it struggled on the higher heartbeats, but from a general perspective, it was able to get most of my heart rate data. And then the Apple Watch Ultra 2, I think because it's a bigger device, it's the same hardware, same software, it struggles a little bit when it comes to getting the most accurate heart rate data. I tried to wear the trail loop, which I found to be a bit more accurate for heart rate data, but it was just slightly more off than the Series 10. The Series 10 is just very small. This band makes it very easy to make it tight and it's less likely to wobble around and more likely to get better heart rate data. I even wore the Whoop as well on my bicep. It's right here. I almost always wear it on here. I have a tan line even. And it looks like the Apple Watch Series 10 beat my Whoop as well, which was on my bicep. It should be more accurate. There's less movement and it's tighter on my bicep. Now let's look at the actual heart rate data. So we can ignore the bright blue one. That's the Amazfit. It was not getting accurate heart rate data. The red is the Phoenix 8 chest strap. So we're, that's the baseline, what we're comparing everything to. Green is the Pace Pro, and black is the Ultra 2, and purple is the Series 10. So in the beginning parts, it looks like the Pace Pro jumped around a bit more than it should have, although it was placed on my wrist where I would typically wear a watch. The Series 10 and the Ultra 2 were very neck and neck with the heart rate strap. The Series 10 just does jump around a little bit. You can even see here the black line, the Series 10 left, the Series 10 wasn't able to hold on as strong, the Coros Pace Pro even worse. But the Series 10 and the heart rate strap are very close together, that's, that's impressive. Over here, we can see the Pace Pro left. It seems like in the same areas, I'm not sure what it is, maybe the movements that I was doing, but the Ultra 2 on my right wrist veered off on the higher end and the Pace Pro on my left wrist veered off on the low end, so something happened here, whereas the Series 10 just held on strong. If you look at it here, same thing, the Pace Pro seemed to jump around a bit. 
I would argue just looking at these graphs in general, it seems like the Pace Pro is the worst in terms of maintaining the heart rate. And then the Ultra 2 after that, the Series 10 just holding on strong as the absolute winner in this in this moment. I did not have a chest, I did not have enough space to test the Amaze Fit T-Rex 2, but I'll do that in a separate video. If you want to see that, let me know in the comments below. And while you're at it, follow me on all the socials at Sherman Shares on Strava, Instagram, X. I love testing technology like this. So if there's anything you want to see, let me know in the comments so I can do that. Heart rate goes to the series 10. Next up, elevation gain. So I looked on Google and it looks like some of the official websites, it's 807 feet of elevation gain for the New York City Marathon. And most of the watches were closer to the thousands. The apples were the only ones in the 800 range and the Apple Watch series 10 gave me 868. So I would argue that was probably the closest. The whoop, I don't know where it got 1200. Maybe it's just using maps data. So it took the raw GPS data from my Apple watches and then it used Google Maps data to pick this elevation number. I'm not sure how I got that. But the T-Rex and the Phoenix 8 were the farthest off with 1,100 and 1,000, if this number is accurate. Calorie burn, we got 3,300 up to 4,200 in terms of calorie burn from all the watches. This is obviously based on heart rate data. If you watch my video where I tested an Apple Watch and all the other gadgets against calorie burn inside of a sports lab, you'll know that they're not gonna be the most accurate. I'll have that video linked at the very end. And then we go into running power. 399, 312, 313, 320, 356, all within the 300 range. The Phoenix 8 seemed to be a lot higher than the other watches. Cadence 167 to 165, 163, very, very close, you know, within a couple numbers. Vertical oscillation, we got seven on the Phoenix 8, nines on the Apple Watches. The other devices did not provide that information. So it looks like the Apple Watches agree. The Phoenix 8, slightly different. Ground contact time, 274, 273, 282, all very close. Stride length, seems like most of the watches were in the 1.1 range, whereas the Pace Pro was in the 1.15 and the Amazfit 1.14. So the Phoenix and the Apple Watches agreed a lot more on each other. And then there were the aerobic anaerobic numbers as well as sweat loss from the Garmin watch, which if my Flowbio S1 worked, I would have had a sweat loss number as well from this device, but sadly the app was not connecting to the device. Now, when it comes to live pacing, I did record some clips where I was using all the watches to show you what it looked like from a live pacing perspective. There were some downsides in terms of when the Garmin disconnected from my watch, it gave me this notification and I was like, I don't know what button to press to get rid of it. When I'm trying to work out and I'm running a marathon and I'm all I'm focused on running and there's other things popping on my screen, it's frustrating. That happens sometimes on all these watches and it was just not ideal. I did have the issue of the orange screen of death on my Apple Watch Ultra 2, which is when I get the workout ready to go and I press the action button, it just shows a blank orange screen. Thinking you've started it, it gives you a haptic feedback, thinking you've started it, but it doesn't actually start the workout. And that was scary for me at the beginning of the New York City Marathon. I even restarted my watch and my phone before to make sure that this wouldn't happen. And somehow it still happened. So I had to like swipe and manually start it with the touch buttons rather than the action button. So there's something with precision start that doesn't seem to be working accurately. I've had this issue on the Ultra 1 my Ultra 2 and now my Ultra 2 Black. Apple, can we please fix this? And that's where I'm gonna go into my recommendations. Now, if you have all the money in the world, which watch would I pick? Clearly, there's a wide variety. The Phoenix 8 is $1,200. The Amazfit T-Rex 3 is $280. You could buy like four of these watches for the price of one. If you have all the money in the world and you just want a fitness tracker device for your runs, which you're gonna most likely take off after the runs, I'd probably pick the Phoenix 8 with the chest heart rate strap just because it has things like precision start where I know it's gonna work. The series 10, great data, but you don't have precision start. I had to do the three, two, one countdown thing and I'm not in love with that. And then the Apple Watch Ultra 2 would be my next best option. Same thing, that precision start doesn't work. When you're in a race and your only thought is you hear the horn, boom, and you press go and you're not starting the workout and run and I'm not gonna look at my watch. And if that doesn't work, it doesn't matter. I've had a couple runs where I actually did that and I kept running and with 10 minutes in, I was like, I didn't even start my watch. So if the watch can't start and stop properly, it doesn't matter how accurate the GPS and heart rate are. Now, if you're like, hey, 80, 20, I don't need to spend all that money, but I want a good enough watch. The T-Rex 3 and the Pace Pro are so budget friendly. $280, $349, dollars those are very well-priced watches. They get very strong data that's correlated close enough. Like you're talking 0 0.01 in terms of distances. The pacing, very close. Like there's no drastic changes in terms of those numbers. So you're gonna get good enough information to inform you on your run and save a lot of money. So if you're just getting into running and if you're gonna run a marathon and you're not sure if you're gonna keep running for the next 10 years, this is a great place to start. I recommend those two watches. And I will always love my Apple Watch. It is a great smartwatch. I wear these day to day, every single day. But if you have no watch at all, this is where I would start. 
subscribe, turn notifications. If you wanna see some other cool videos, I've done a lot of testing. I did one where I tested my Apple Watch and other sleep trackers against a sleep lab. And I also share how to use your Apple Watch for running. Those videos will be linked right here. Go watch them. We'll see you in the next one. Peace.